Ah, oh, shalom, salam tonight, and I just link in the Arasia de Nostafarine. I am Wendem Yadin. We want to follow up. Um, this is a follow up to um, some of the recent posts concerning uh, the Nibiru or Nibiru and concerning the cosmic uh, celestial phenomena that occurred recently. Now, many might think that, well, because they're looking for a sign that there was no, it was no biggie. There was no major sign. The whole earth did not come to an end and the world did not fall down and so forth and so on. But even the word says that um, woe to those who need or, or, you know, who look for a sign rather, who look for a sign. There are signs and there were signs even of this um, Elenine or Planet X which is the tenth planet, but according to um, uh, Sitchin, um, Sitchin says, of course, he says it's the twelfth planet. And there's some controversy or controversy concerning Sitchin's um, uh, interpretations of the whole Sumerian, Akkadian, uh, Mesopotamian ancient legends, uh, Enuma Elish, and the Gilgamesh, and some of these tales and stories as to what the real meaning is. Some have put um, Sitchin to task concerning his um, interpretation and concerning some of the, the interpolations that he have added to his idea of the Anunnaki and of Nibiru. Now, what we would like to do in this follow-up, first of all, is to point to the fact that something very interesting happened, at least here in the New York area, concerning the whole um, uh, Planet X, Elanine, whether it's Elanine, whether it's a comet, whether it's a brown dwarf star, or whether it's a planet, that still remains to be seen. But during the time that it was supposed to pass through this particular orbit or come closest to Earth, some vary on how close exactly this came to Earth. And because we don't have our own firsthand, you could say, um, researches as far as telescopes and other things, we have to rely on what the scientists and the different data that comes out from the so-called experts really are. And we understand that a lot of it might be shaded different ways, depends on different um, interpretations and perspectives. So some might shade the information a little more to say, yes, this is the aliens, and others might say, no, it was just uh, another cosmic phenomenon. But what we notice here in the, in the New York area and in the north, northeast of America is that there was this weather pattern that circulated and circulated over this area. And now all the news people, as we're now approaching um, Yom Kippur coming up on the Friday, the, the Shabbat Eve. Um, the Friday is Yom Kippur. We're still in these 10 days, the 10 days of Or, or the Yamim um, Norayim, which is the 10 days of Or. And thank the Almighty we was able to, to post um, the majority of our reasonings concerning that that we recorded about a, a, about a week ago. We gave the post that up. We've been having some interference, whether it's man-made or it's just a part of the bad technology, whether it's intentional, that we haven't been able to post up um, some of the recent, wasn't getting good internet connection. That still remains to be seen. So just pray for us, brothers and sisters, that um, whatever it is, we could kill, cramp, and paralyze all weak heart conceptions and wipe them out of creation in the name of the King of Kings, our God and Father, and his Christ, Yeshua HaMoshiach. Now, there was this weather pattern. Basically, it was like there was this circulating weather pattern that caused a lot of rain in the northeastern quadrant or portion of America. And now all the newsmen and the weathermen are having a sigh of relief that this weather pattern has left. Now, we know that's, that's very curious, understanding the whole relations with the planets and the moon and the magnetics, that this weather pattern, a circulating weather pattern over two, three, or four states 
has been swirling for the last two weeks, and now they say as far as, far as um, Wednesday going into Wednesday, Tuesday to Wednesday, it's begun to ease some connection with the whole jet stream. In fact, the jet stream is out of its, quote, normal orbitation, too. And now this, this will coincide exactly to the period that this Elanine, this planet or comet named Elanine, or if it's planet X, or if it is the elusive Nibiru or Nibiru, it is now passing out of this region. So that's a very interesting sign. That's one of the interesting signs. Now, connected with it are some other related signs, too, but they are a little bit, I won't say more difficult to prove, but they're a little more difficult to document, like whether the Earth's rotation has slowed down or whether it has sped up or the wobble effect, so forth and so on. But one thing was clear at least with the water and the winds and the weather pattern. We were locked into a weather pattern for about two weeks, and that would be the period of time when this comet or planet X was coming in and when it has gone out. Now, we had posted in one of our former videos whether this is a, whether this is a hoax, this whole Nibiru thing, whether it's a hoax. We don't think that the idea of Nibiru is a hoax or of the Nephilim or of the so-called Anunnaki, or, but how it's being presented, you know, is being hyped up, and there's a lot of irrational and incorrect um, information, and, and, and therefore disinformation that's being put out there. What we like to do from an Ethiopic perspective in this particular update is to touch on the um, etymology of this word um, Nibiru or Nibiru, from an Ethiopic perspective, because we find that there's some very interesting um, uh, etymological true word roots, you know, connected with this idea of Nibiru. Now, some say the Nibiru was a planet. This is this is where the the basic ideas are on this. That it was a planet. It's this twelfth planet. Some say. Others say it's actually the 10th planet. Years ago, they called this the black planet. And therefore, because of that, there's a lot of Afrocentric and black folks that say, yeah, they, they're cheering on this planet in the Nibiru because it's a fear of a black planet. But from all the information concerning Nibiru that's out there, it is not a very, it should not be seen as a very positive thing in the sense of, the day of the Lord is not a day of light, but it's a day of darkness. It's a, it's a day of some uh, catastrophic signs. In other words, we may not like certain things, but to have a total collapse of so-called civilized society, so-called civilized society, um, is not a very pleasant matter. And therefore. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But we need to utilize, as it says, to redeem, um, to redeem the time because the days are evil. And Nibiru seems very much connected with um, more evil than the kingdom of God in the sense that it's not a positive sign of heaven. So Nibiru is not a positive sign. But what is the etymological and the Ethiopic etymological connection with Nibiru. So what we're going to do right here is we're going to try to get into a little bit of this um, in this particular um, presentation, and we're going to go to the Gutas. We think it's necessary to begin with the, the Gutas. And what we found that was very interesting is that Nibiru, when we begin off with one of our, this is a, very old book. It's kind of fallen apart. We had it for a little while. I think this is um, our introduction to classical Ethiopic um, by Thomas Lambden. So you can get a copy of that, hopefully. Um, we don't have this book as one of the books that we offer right now. But one of the first lessons, actually it's in Lesson 1, Lesson 1, on Ethiopic, one thing we find when we get to 1.3, there's 1.1, there's 1.2, 1 
and there's 1.3, the third part of Lesson 1 in Ethiopic concerning uh, Nibiru or Nibiru, it says, um, although we, re we shall defer full treatment of the verb until later, it is necessary here to introduce the third person forms of the inflection called the perfect. And in the singular, it is um, nebere, which means he sat the third person masculine. And in the third person feminine, it's neber, neberet, neberet. So we have nebere and neberet. And then in the plural of the third person masculine, it is neberu, which means they, they, male, sat. And then you have nebera. Nebara means they female sat, and it explains that the four endings, the e, the et, the u, the a, are used on all verbs in the language to mark these four forms of the perfect, regardless of the shape of the stem, regardless of the shape of the stem. So now it's breaking down. A, a, a linguistic um, portion of it, and it says, um, "Mote he died, um, Riye uh, he saw, um, Anbere he set, Asa teba a, Asa teba a, he implored." Note that the pronominal subject he, she, they is included in the verb form itself and need not be expressed separately. The Ethiopic, or the Gutes, properly, the Gutes perfect corresponds to the English simple past. So the, the Ethiopic perfect, the verb for the perfect, it corresponds to the English simple past, like he went, he wrote, etc. Or the present perfect, he has gone, he has written. The basic lexical form of the Ethiopic verb is the third person masculine singular of the perfect. In the lesson vocabularies and in the glossary, we shall always give the English meaning in the infinitive form. Thus, nebere means to sit. Nebere means to sit. So, in the sense of so at the very beginning of um, any serious Ethiopic studies, we're going to come across this idea, at least what sounds according to word, sound, and power. You know, the word, you know, the word, the sound of the word, and the power, the meaning of the word. So let's go through this right here and give a, give a brief visual to this. And this is what is found in any good Ethiopic first first lesson or first semester work, first lesson, Ethiopic, you will come across this. We have, first of all, we have, um, we're speaking about the uh, Nibiru, right? And then we are going to the Ethiopic, all right? We're going to the Ethiopic, right? Let's see if this is a good, let's use another, um, another marker we have here. Okay, so the first one would be Ne. Be re. Let's do this over. Nebere, right? We have nebere. Or some would write it as nebere. Or vary it with nebere, right? This means he sat. Then we have neberet, right? Nebere, which means she sat. Then we have neberu, right? And then we have ne be, ra. Now this one, which is the closest, this one right here is the closest to what we're speaking about because this one will be ne be, ru, right? Ne be, ru. Ne be, ru. Now, of course, when you see it written, it's n i b i r u, but the whole vowels, you see the whole vowel pointing is something that is curious in the ancient language. And besides the Ethiopic, a lot of the vowel pointing is not very clear. So that means basically the basic letters is the N, the B, and the R, and the U sound. So this is what links it with this. Now this means right here, we could put this down for a moment. 
This means right here, they, they sat, right? They. Now, who they are, they sat. Now, of course, if we go to Sitchin and to uh, Sitchin's followers, some call it, say, Sitchin's worshipers or the Sitchin cult who believe the whole Anunnaki and the Nibiru thing, they will say, well, this is just further proof because here in Ethiopic, another very ancient language, we would say actually the first for us is the first language. It says, they sat. They sat. Now, the idea of they sat is interesting because the idea of they sat, the idea of sitting also means being enthroned. The idea is being enthroned. In other words, they sat as king or they sat, you know, they sat. It also has that sense of they dwelt, to dwell someplace. They dwelt. So we have enthroned here. We have the idea of dwelt in a sense that they resided. They resided someplace. So from the simple they sat, neberu, very much in word sound, according to word sound, as Nibiru, Nibiru, Nibiru. And we know that the Ethiopic was actually prior and proto to the Sumerian Akkadian because from all good um, archaeology and ancient reconstruction, the Ethiopia or the ancient Tobia, the ancient Ethiopia was prior to or before the Sumerian, in fact, the original Sumerian, Akkadian, and um, Osirians or Assyrians were actually Ethiopic-related people. You can look this up. They call them the blackheads. They call these people the blackheads. Yes, it's not being racist. Not. It's interesting because today they're talking about niggerhead. You know, the niggerhead was this, was this cracker that's running for Republican um, a candidate for president, you know, he goes to this ranch they call niggerhead. But the ancient Assyrians, Sumerians, they have a name for certain, the certain black blood original influence over there where they call them um, blackheads. And this is actually based on a translation out of the Kuni form, the Kunea form, so forth and so on. So these were the originators the, from Ethiopia actually comes the the origins or the originations of the true Akkadian and Sumerian civilization. Now, if you look at a lot of the Nibiru, Nibiru stuff like that that's out there, um, very little points. They might go as far as Egypt, ancient Egypt, but they really do not take it to its logical and obvious roots in um, the Kui land or Tob Tobia, which we call today Ethiopia, they do not go to the Ethiopic roots. Now, of course, much has changed over time, places, people, things, certain things, but the language, what is interesting, the language, in this language, the Ethiopic or the Gutas, do we have the evidence of this code? Now, you have to remember that this is the Ethiopic, too, that the oldest and most extant version of the book of Hanok or Enoch, as well as uh, the book of um, Jubilees is found. So many have also made reference to back up certain claims of the Nephilim or the Anunnaki or the fallen angels and even the Nibiru. They have linked that with the book of uh, with the Epistle of Job, and then they've linked the Epistle of Job as a direct quotation, actually, out of the Ethiopic book of Enoch. Often you'll find them say the book of Enoch, but more correctly it's the Ethiopic book of Enoch because if it wasn't for the Ethiopic or the Gutters version of the book of Enoch, they would not have the full picture and the whole story. So it's through the Ethiopic that we have a preservation of this this ancient connection to the fallen angels, to the watchers, and particularly to Genesis chapter 6. Because Nibiru is very important for those who seek to reconstruct what Genesis chapter 6. And I'm, I'm sure you should recall what Genesis chapter 6 says, and perhaps we should, um, let's see, we should just go there for a moment. Let's just turn our Bibles to Genesis chapter 6 for some who might not be as familiar. In Genesis chapter 6, it speaks about the flood. It speaks about the marriage of the, of the Canaanites, 
the children of Cain, the marriage of the Cainites with the Sethites. So we have the Sethites and we have the Cainites, which is all, uh, another very interesting and loaded part of research and study and speculation and dialogue. You know, who were the Cainites, who were the Sethites? Are these Sethites linked with suits from ancient Egypt, the brother of um, Osiris who had killed him and the uncle of Horus? Is that the same Seth or suit? Some say yes, some say no, and we'll touch on that hopefully um, after this. It says, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the faces of the earth, the daughters and daughters and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, or the Bani Elohim, saw the daughters of men, that they were fear. And fear is not to say they were light-skinned, you understand, to say that they were beautiful. And if you look it up in the language, fear means that they were beautiful. But here, because this is King James and stuff, and, 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 we, and we note this particular um, period of time or history, um, that fear idea, you know, is, is there. So just to correct that and clarify that. And they took them wives of all which they chose. So they saw the sons of the Bani Elohim, saw that the, the, the Banat or the, the daughters of, of, of the Enosh or, or, or men, they saw that they were beautiful and they took them wives. They took them wives of all that they chose. Now, verse 3, there's a warning of yod Hey wow Hey or Yahweh, Jehovah, if you please. And it says, And the Lord, Yahweh, or Jehovah, said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. Now here in verse 4, here it speaks of the ante, or the antediluvian civilization. Now ante in this sense, should not be confused with anti in the other sense. Ante means before, and diluvian means before the flood. So the civilization that existed before there was this global or worldwide sort of a, a flood. Now, some even debate whether this was really true or not. But it's very clear, if a, if, a, if a little bit of rain in certain places, as we've been witnessing very recently, can cause all this devastation, and we see what water can do in the tsunami and other places, and this is just a little bit of rain. This is just a couple of, a couple of underground eruptions and underwater eruptions can bring up the water level so much. We could just imagine putting it into context with the flood that the entire civilization you know, or, or where, where there was civilization could be over, over flooded. One of the reasons why they find, they say, seashells and, and other water erosions at the base of the sinks, you know, they find these water ero erosions at the base of the sinks, which clearly shows that there was one time when it seems as though all of that was underwater. Even the pyramids have certain signs of water erosion, and even the Nile is some distant, some a little distance away from that. So there would have to be a significant amount of water upon the face of the earth. So when they tell you that the pyramids was built by this king or that king just a couple of thousand years ago, what they should really tell you is that these things were rebuilt. You see, they were rebuilt or, or renovated in a sense. They were, they were built up again. And those kings took credit for that, notwithstanding a name of a king somewhere inside. You know, anybody can do graffiti. You understand? It wasn't like a cartouche. It wasn't like anything that says, this king built this at this day, at this time, so forth and so on. Because they couldn't really take that credit. They understood that this was there, but they rebuilt this after some um, catabolic or cataclysmic happening, which all points to the truth of what the B-I-B-L-E, what the Bible is saying right here. Now, at verse 4, it says, there were giants, very tall men or very tall beings in the earth in those days. A lot of people laugh these things off until they have come across very recently as well um, some very large bones or some you know, skulls and, and sometimes even complete, almost complete skeletons they have come across, which basically proves that these were very large men just like Goliath and um, 
his brother that was killed, I think, by a Khaled. And, and, and David, you know, David had wiped out um, Goliath. But there was very, these very tall beings, you understand, um, called giants. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they bear children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Now, that renown actually be translated more as men of the Shem, men of name. They, they were men of Shem. Now, they were not Shemites or Semites in the way that modern whitewashed Judaism Christianity allocates who's a Shemite, who's not a Shemite, but they were men of Shem in the sense of men of renown. So if this was to be translated as they translated the other parts, they would have to say that the men of renown were men of the name, or they were men of Shem. They were men of name. But then people would say, well, Shem, you know, they would make you a little confused. Not actually confused, they would understand that when it says, blessed be the Lord God of Shem, he's not just saying, blessed be your Lord God, but blessed be the Lord God of the name. But some have chosen to say, okay, what we're going to do is distinguish this and say, just Shem is blessed and all the rest of you are like cursed. And a lot of that is, is, is the religious Pharisees, Sadducees, and other scribes that have introduced from their own mind and usually white and usually racist and usually very myopic. They could not admit that this truth comes out of inner Africa and in order to decipher it, we also have to go so-called back or review and go to the heart of the matter. Um, but that hasn't been done. But anyway, be that as it may right there, this is the significant part that tends to throw people, uh, not throw them off, but there's a lot of different, interesting, a lot of it's very interesting what some people make out of this. But then when you critically go and study this and see whether it all stacks up, you understand, does it make sense in the context of what's being said here? It can't just sound good in, in, in that limited sense in the verse, but not make sense in the portion of the chapter and not make sense in the book. It has to make sense both, like a phrase, you can't take a, a portion of the phrase and say it means this, but then in the next verse you're going to try to translate the same thing a different way. It has to make sense in an in a, in a entire context. And this is where a lot of the theories concerning the Nibiru, concerning the fallen angels, the Nephilim, a lot of it falls on its head. So we have to go to the Ethiopic, and this is why in dealing with Nibiru, we are interpreting and seeking to understand Nibiru from its Ethiopic context. And here we have four um, primary good is, um, 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 inflections. Nebere, which means he sat. Neberet, which means she sat. Neberu, which means they masculine, they male, they who all were male sat. And then we have Nebera, which means they, which were are female, they female. So the good is similar to the Hebrew and many other of the Shemitic languages, when even talking about a crowd or a multitude of people, it will tend to distinguish, is it a crowd of males or is it a crowd of females? And this is, is lost in um, many of the modern languages today. And so when we're looking at even the scriptures, in this context we can see more clear, clear of who and what is being spoken of. So, now, that is to help us put this matter into a little better context concerning uh, Nibiru. So, Nibiru, Ethiopically speaking, Ethiopically speaking, we're going to touch on the Amharic, we're going to touch on the Amharic as well for this, right? Ethiopically speaking, Ethiopically speaking, Nibiru, 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 would mean they. Now, this all fits even the context of the Sumerian, um, the Sumerian, um, Akkadian, Enuma, Elish, and even to some degree what uh, Sitchin, what Sitchin in his 12th planet is saying. Because he said that Nibiru was the name of the planet. He says that, or the 12th, or the or planet X. 
and those who were the Nibiru lords, you understand, these were the lords, they sat, so they sat as lords, they sat as being enthroned, they sat, they dwelt, they dwelt on this so-called planet X, they dwelt on this 10th um, planet or the 12th planet, they were enthroned, they were lords, you understand, in some sense, over somebody, because the whole idea of they sitting, they sat, if we now would follow this word a little more carefully from the Gittas, before even touching on them hard, because first we need to understand it in its, in its, in its Gittas sense, that the idea of they sitting, you understand, is they being enthroned, it is speaking about it, they in the sense of um, um, they dwelt. These are those who dwelt someplace. So what I find interesting about this Nibiru thing, because you have to remember that some would dis 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 dispute with us when we say that, well, actually the Akkadian Sumerian civilization um, was a byproduct of ancient Ethiopian in the Africa black civilization, people would say, no, some actually think that the Sumerians and the Akkadians were before the Egyptians. That is not true. Because in one of the primary places that does not really praise so-called Hamitic culture directly, the Bible, it points out that Namrud or Nimrod, he went out there to establish certain civilizations. And this is long before all the people, even a lot of the archaeology that people get from ancient times, always kind of links in to a period that is post-Nimrodic. In other words, and Nimrod was known as the son of Kush. The ancient Egyptians called the land that their gods or their civilizers were from, speaking of Osiris or the Osirian family, they said that they came from the Kui. They came from the Kui land. This is how they refer to Kush as the Kui land or the spirit land, the God land. So now we have Namrud or Nimrod coming out of this land and going to the east. And this is all connected now with Genesis chapter 11 and the Tower of Babel, which is at a later stage of this Nibiru, this Nibiru myth or Nibiru legend. So the key now for us is to go further into the Ethiopic to make the connection with Nibiru or to find what other connection. Now, one of the most plausible is that it does not tell us who this they were because they could be anybody, but it does give us a context for this name. Now, there's one other uh, connection that we, actually two other linguistically, etymologically speaking, that we like to make with this Nibiru speaking about Ethiopic, but it's more now coming from the child of Ethiopic, and we're speaking about the Amharic language. In the Amharic language, we have two words. We have now, see, Nebaru now in Amharic actually would be the part of speech that would be used to say they were, to say they were, they were. So it's a they sat it would be in the sense of they were. Remember that difference that I mentioned in the classical introduction book that we read to you? It said that, um, that in the English, it would have the sense of the more the past tense sense. But in the Ethiopic, it has more they sat as in like they were sitting. They were enthroned. They had dwelt. So in the Amharic sense, they sat would be they were. So when we say um, Inesu they, Nebaru, Inesu Nebaru, you could say Inesu Anunnaki Nebaru, they, the Anunnaki, they were. And the, but in the good sense, it could mean that they had dwelt someplace. And in an extended sense now, and here's the key right here, is this. Um, interpretation right here. They were enthroned. They were enthroned. And here's where we put our, we put a little question mark right here as to who they were. If we want to say that um, Negusa Negest, Nebaru, we could say Negusa Negest, Nebar, but in a more honorific sense, we could say that even though we're speaking about one person, one individual, 
we are giving that one individual the they sense, like the royal we sense, that we in Ethiopia, as His Majesty says, we. So we refer to him, though we know he is a singular individual, we refer to him in that um, royal plural sense, like the word Elohim, as being they when speaking, in a sense, concerning him or speaking honorifically. So this, these are some grammatical, contextual kind of keys that is very important to understand, especially when we are going into ancient, you know, ancient um, writings and we're trying to interpret some of the ancient mythologies, to put it contextually as well as grammatically. You know what I'm saying? Grammatically in this con and it will take all this data, all the bits of information and put it together in its proper context and not to interpret as many people have done with Nibiru. They've taken this whole idea and they have self-styled the way they want to see it. This is why we put out the word that some of, some of what's going out there is hoax. It's a hoax and a bad joke because people are trying to superimpose their own fantasies or superstitions or fears or phobias onto this and to elicit a certain reaction, you understand, from it. We hope that we didn't, we didn't fall into that sort of a trap in putting out certain information. We just said, okay, here is the information about it. Here's how this connects with that. We're not saying that the prophecy that this is going to happen and when this happens, buildings are going to fall down and the whole earth is going to blow up and kind of like that. Not to hype people, but to put it into the proper context and allow people the free will, you understand, and the freeness of mind to draw out of it. As one brother, I think, posted on our comments page, they said that, and I thank you for it. I thank you, my people, for that. Um, that what better advice to give anyone than to study and show yourself approved. In other words, don't just take my word for it. Trust me in what I'm saying, but look it up for yourself so you can say, yes, I I know this. So yes, I've trusted the brother. He said such and such, but I went and looked it up, and he was right. I found more stuff. That is the testimony that we hope our true brothers and sisters will testify to, at least. Right? Now, Nibiru also, one final, one more, should we say, not final, because we don't know if this, this will be final, you understand, because the Holy Spirit um, does not, you know, give given um, measure, you know, the Holy Spirit can give, so the Holy Spirit may give us more to this. Um, you know, that famous, there's a famous verse in Scripture, and perhaps we'll, we'll summarize with this. There's a famous verse in um, Scripture, and whenever people talk about Ethiopia or Ethiopians, you usually hear a lot of um, Ethiopians and ones talk about, well, yeah, Ethiopia is in the is in the Bible, and they'll point to this um, area of Scripture. I think it's in, um, in, in Jeremiah. And some of you might know where I'm going with it. Let me see if I can uh, find this right here. And, um, and this is in, in the Amharic. And I think also in the Gutters. I, I just have to check on that. I don't want to... I don't want to go on the record and say it is, and it might be a, a slightly different uh, permutation of um, the word. But there's a verse here, and it's in um, chapter, chapter, chapter 13 of Jeremiah. And we say this, this is a possible uh, Nibiru, a possible Nibiru, Nibiru connection. And in Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23, it says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard or the leopard his spots? Question mark. Then may ye, you all, also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Now people usually stop there and say, see, Ethiopia is in the Bible. Right? Well, yeah. But have you ever given the context, uh, opportunity to, to the, the entire context of it to really show you what's the full picture of it? Most times people will quote this and only 
quote up to the question mark, and they will present the question mark as though it is a period there and not a question. They're saying, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Question. And it goes on. This is still one verse, and, but many people will do violence to the scripture because they will quote it as though this is the only, this is the whole verse right here. Because the second part of this, of this verse, it says, "Then may ye also do good, that are accustomed to do evil." Well, well, well that seems to be a change right there, doesn't it? See, see, this is another example, an area where people might be quoting a scripture out of pride or, or some other um, vanity um, of mine and not really putting it into proper context. Because as I scroll over this chapter right here, chapter 13, in Jeremiah chapter 13, please, my people, and, and other people too, because a lot of people have gotten caught up saying, well, you're the Ethiopian in the Bible. See, the Ethiopian, their skin, their complexion, they can't change it. Uh, are, are, are you serious? <laughs> I mean, look at Michael Jackson for a moment. You know, um, may God have have mercy on his soul. But it says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Normally we would think no, because the Ethiopians were known to have this particular complexion. Uh, the leopard was known to have these sort of spots. In other words, be distinctive for these features. But in the very same verse it says, then... May ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. So it's saying that people who are accustomed to doing evil, hopefully you will have a change. But can the Ethiopian change his skin? Did Ethiopians change their skin? There's a, there's a, there's a, I won't call it a joke, but it was presented to me as a joke. But actually, in this joke, there's a lot of wisdom in it. Um, years ago, you know, upon the meeting. Um, Ethiopians from abroad, you know, because we're Ethiopians, um, I mean, we're Ethiopians abroad, but me Ethiopians from so-called home, you know, as we are Ethiopians in the diaspora over here, um, people say, why Ethiopians always have, some of them have serious face, even some of them look very serious, like they're mean and angry, you know, you might have noticed that, I don't know what better way to express it, so some of my peeps don't get upset about it, just understand, um, and so I made a joke, or a comment, it sounded like a joke. Why Ethiopians look angry? Why do they always look serious? Why do they always look like that? And the response was that um, Ethiopians made white people. And, and at first we laughed at it and said, what, Ethiopians made white people? You know, okay, that's funny. I mean, but you know why it's really funny? Because there's some truth to it. Now, can the leopard change his spots? Do you know that the panther and the leopard is really the same creature? And, and think about it for a moment. Now, that brings us to this word right here. Um, it brings us to the word nabur. All right, nabur. Right, the word nebur, nebur. Brings to this word nebur. Nebur is leopard. But then, if you study this and go and take it to and take it to the um, to its uh, good as roots, never, you understand, never, or in some forms, in some forms of archaic Amharic, as well as some forms of 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 good as, if I'm correct, it would even be not never but never, 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 but usually translated, interpreted as never. Now. When you go to the Haile Selassie Bible, the Met of Kedus, the Amharic Bible, and you go to uh, Arimius, Tinbite Arimius, um, chapter 13, at uh, verse, what was it, verse uh, 20, um, what was it, 23, verse 23, it says, the Wunu, Echop Yawi, Melkun, Weis, Nebur Zena Gorgornetina Yilawit Zen Yichilale Bezian Gize Kafatin Ye Lemedachu Inante Degmo Begola Madrega Tichilalachu Madreg Tichilachu. It says then or in that time 
evil, you who are accustomed to, e- to do evil, you also good will be able to do good. You also will be able to do good. But it asks the same question, but when in truth, Ethiop Yahweh, Ethiop Yahweh, Melkun, his melk, his 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 face or his image, his image, right? Melkun race or the nibur, the nibur, the leopard Zena Gurgurnetin Yila with Zenichlalin is an Ethiopian able to change his 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 face to say his image or a leopard his 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 stripes. It's interesting because it has leopard it says his stripes but it can mean spots too. But in a, another way it can mean stripes. But we'll, we'll deal with that in a moment. The, the plane, the peshat, as we say in the Hebrew, the peshat or the, the plane, the terra, the basic reading is can an Ethiopian, just as it's translated here, can the Ethiopian, but can an, an Ethiopian, and it says Ichop Yawi, can an Ethiopian type, it's not saying an Ethiopian, it's using Ethiopia as an adjective. So it could mean to be interpreted, can a black man, can a black person, someone who was melanated, can they change their melanation? Or can the leopard change its spots? And at one time, the answer would be, oh, no, 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 no. But here's what they're failing to understand, that, that Yahweh, that Adonai, he already understood that at one time, it couldn't be, but we will come to a time when people would be able to even change their complexions. I mean, and, and this, this has gone on. It changed their features. Now they're changing their gender. They're all sort of changes. I mean, they have certain techniques now that if they want to take the spots off a leopard, you understand? They'll be able to take the spots that a leopard was born with that's a part of its 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 innate DNA change that. And then it, this makes now sense because the second part of the verse is, then may ye also do good that are accustomed, that are accustomed to doing evil. You understand? So it's saying that those who are accustomed to doing evil that normally – uh, Ethiopian, a black person can't change their blackness, and a leopard can't change his spottiness, right? Then also, it says, then may ye also do good that are accustomed. See, the key word is accustomed. We're accustomed to an Ethiopian having that complexion. We're accustomed to a leopard having those spots. But now we're living in a time of, the key word, a time of change, so those who were accustomed to doing evil would be able somehow to change their evil nature. Now, this whole message here is not just Jeremiah, not just a historical message, but as we say, the whole Bible basically, especially the prophets, is Christ. It's the Moshiach. It's Yehoshua. It's our black Lord and Savior that is, that is speaking through all of these things, all of these signs and types and examples for one reason and one particular reason, and he's speaking about salvation, he's speaking about repentance, it's through that repentance and that born again aspect that those who were accustomed to doing evil, who were used to doing evil, who doing evil was a part of their, almost of their DNA, even they would have the possibility or the opportunity in the fullness of time to make a change. And it, my eye keeps glancing on this right here in the same chapter, verse 10, where it says, This evil people, this evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them, shall even be as this girdle, which is good for nothing. I think that's a very important message for um, careless Ethiopians especially to to consider, especially since um, the creeping coup, the godless and creeping coup against um, our godfather, 
Nagusa Neges, Ketamawi Haile Selassie, something to consider. Because if we look at Ethiopia today, compared with Ethiopia of yesterday, Ethiopia of today is almost good for nothing because they, they have changed their nature. You know what I'm saying? They have been able to, in a sense, change their nature. So verse 10 kind of shows you something there too. So when you put this whole chapter into context, you need to understand that, yes, it is saying that the Ethiopians have very unique complexion. You know what I'm saying? It's saying that the leopard has a very unique spot to it. But it's saying that the people who were accustomed to doing evil would be able to do good, will come out of that custom or that tradition or that which they thought they, they couldn't change. And we're, like I keep saying, we're living in a time of, um, in a time of, of, of change. So the context of this particular chapter is important. Another thing about that verse I just quoted from Jeremiah 13 and 10, where it says imagination. Did you pick up on that? If you go to Genesis where we were in touching on the Nibiru and the fallen angels and the, and the watchers and the Anunnaki and, and, and Sitchin's um, um, 12th planet speculation, if we put all these things into context and look at chapter 6, it speaks about the imagination. You remember in chapter 6? Let's just go there and compare this for a moment, and we probably can sum up um, right here for the first part of, of this particular lesson, getting to the Ethiopic origins or roots of this idea in Nibiru. Here in verse, we left off at verse 4, Genesis 6 and 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, that they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of which were, which Nebiru, which were of old, men of renown. The purpose of Yahweh in judgment. Now, we're moving to a judgment time as we're coming up, but we're in a judgment time right now. And every day is a judgment day, but we're in a particular season, in the fall festival season, and we're moving from the, the Yom Teruah, or the Day of Trumpets, we're moving with, with these ten days of awe, or the Yamim or Norayim, and we're moving to Yom Kippurim. You know what I'm saying? And in the teaching that we've, we've taught on that, it basically demonstrates that this is an opportunity of the even the wicked to change. This is this is the before the judgment comes down. Before the judgment comes down, and now Yom Kippur is not a festive day. It's a, it's a holy day, a holy time, but it's a day of fasting. It's a day actually, according to the word, the Torah. It's a day of afflicting our souls, where we should afflict our souls. And it's interesting that this Yom Kippur is coinciding with the Shabbat time. So notice we're in this jubilee year of the Metaf Kedus, the publication of the Bible of Haile Selassie, which is the Lion of Judah, fulfilling Revelation 5.5. 5. We're living 50 years later in a jubilee time. That was on the Shabbat, right? And then now Yom Kippur, the Day of Judgment, is also happening or the Time of Atonement, which is a time of judgment, also on a Shabbat Friday evening coming up. So it's very, very interesting and significant if we put these things into their context. But here, Yahweh explains the purpose. The purpose of judgment is being explained in verse 5 of Genesis chapter 6. It says, And Elohim saw the wickedness, saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil, was only evil continually. Right? So Elohim saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth or in the land, so to say, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now compare Genesis 6 and 5 with Jeremiah 13 and 10. This evil people which refuse to hear my words, which walk in the imagination of their heart and walk after other gods to serve them and to worship them shall even be as this girdle 
which is good for nothing. Because this chapter that we find the famous Ethiopian quote, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots, is called the sign of the linen girdle. The sign of the linen girdle. And it's a very, very important chapter which kind of cautions us of having pride. Like many Ethiopians have a lot of pride being Ethiopians. And many blacks, black people, even over here in the diaspora, have a pride in Afrocentricity and blackness. But it's not a pride because they know God and they know the true God. It's not a pride out of that. It's, it's a vain, it's, it's a worthless pride. And Yahweh is showing in this particular chapter, which we really need to study this chapter instead of just pointing out a verse. You know, one will point out a verse, but we need to really put the chapter into its proper context because so much more. And then when we look at that verse, the chapter in proper context, then we really will say our will. We really will understand something that's really useful instead of taking this one verse, Jeremiah 13 and 23, as a reason to boast. You know how many Ethiopians, black people at home and abroad, have pointed to this verse, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots, without even understanding the context of the chapter is, in a sense, not, it's using the Ethiopians as a good example, but it's also pointing a warning, a warning against pride. He says if we are to be proud in anything, we should be proud in that we, we know Yahweh and our relationship, our covenant relationship with Yahweh. You know what I'm saying? In other words, our pride should be through our relationship with the true God and our good standing, not our pride being in, 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 in vain or, or useless things. or Like I said, the pride of many Ethiopians are the ancestors before, like the pride of black people and the Afrocentrics are in things that happened a long time ago that they don't even properly understand, but because we can see black archaeology and such and such, we say, oh, those black people, so forth and so on, but we are still walking in the imagination of our own hearts and we're under a judgment. So it is time, past time actually, but time still exists to repent. And I'm just going to go through the rest of this chapter right here from, from verse 24 to 27 where it says, go over 23 again, it says, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Therefore will I scatter them as the stumble, the stubble, that passeth away by the wind of the wilderness. This is thy lot, the portion of thy measures from me, saith Yahweh, because thou hast forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. Therefore will I discover thy skirts upon thy face, that thy shame may appear. <laughs> I have seen thine adulteries and thy nighings, you know what the nines are? Uh, uh, uh. This, is a, this is a wild chapter when you understand it in proper context. The lewdness of thy whoredom and thine abominations on the hills of the fields. Woe to thee, O Jerusalem. Wilt thou not be made clean? What shall it be? What shall it once be? Or when, when shall it once be? When once? Like when will it? Like when will it be that this people would be clean? And then some have tried to force the issue. We already know that he was a black, but some have pointed to the, the next chapter where it says, Judah mourneth, and the gates they of languish. They are black to the ground. And the cry of Jerusalem is is, is, is going up. They say, well, you see what it says, we are black to the ground. Um, that proves that we are black, or the, the Hebrews are black. I mean, there's a lot of other proof. The better proof is the part about the Ethiopian and um, his skin. Can he change his skin? Unfortunately, today, yeah, ones can change to go from darker skin. I mean, how many people that we know were dark-skinned people, we see them a couple of years later, they're like lights, uh, well, you're bathing in milk, we don't know what. But anyway, it's a little bit off for the subject matter, maybe, I don't know, because 
I'm just following the inspiration to share this with you all. But bringing it once again back to this, let's let let's kind of note this right here. The first, the first was right here. This is the first nebbutu right here. The 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 second ideas or the second ideas of this is really right over here to 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 dwell, like to dwell. They sat, they were, they were the wickedness. You understand? Know they were. It's explained that in in Genesis uh, chapter six and so on. Now the secondary idea is right here. Or we could take this as the first idea coming from Amharic, Nebur, 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 which basically means um, the leopard, the leopard, also related to the panther, the pantera, the panthera, as one of the names that the Jews say that the Jesus, that or the Yeshua they know was Yeshua panthera. They say he was the son of some Roman soldier. This is in the Jewish, some of the Jewish uh, Talmud and other things. They call him um, Jesus or Yeshua, Yehoshua Panthera, which is uh, interesting because they're talking about the Jesus who is the black Jesus, even in the Jewish Talmud and some of the other writings. They call him Panthera because that's a little wink wink to the leopard to um, Jeremiah 13 and 23. So, we can see a, 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 a better clarity to this. Now, the Nibiru, you understand, can better be understood Ethiopically, and um, we hope that this has been in some wise um, helpful. Stay tuned. More to come, and uh, share your comments or, or critique or, or anything else with us. So, Shalom Arastafari.